Good morning. Thank you for that. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and, uh, and, and talk with all of you. And hopefully um, this will be useful as you think about uh, you know, careers that you might consider, how you might approach them, what the implications are. You know, I recognize that some of you may leave here in an hour and say the last thing in the world I ever want to do is get into a corporate role or in corporate finance. And you know, if that's the case, I actually consider this a successful hour as well because what you need to do is kind of winnow down what works and what doesn't work for you. So um, just so I understand the room a little bit, is, is everybody here, or maybe hands if you're a, a business student of some sort or other? Okay, how many people are finance? Keep your hands up. All right, so I'll just talk to the two of you. Uh, a lot of what I'll talk to you about is, 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 is you know, what goes on in a corporation. I can tell you, you know, what goes on in the HR department of a corporation or the IT department or the marketing department is pretty similar to finance, the way you're structured, the way you work. Um, so you know, Dr. Williams you know, covered, uh, I have to use the mouse. So I want to talk to you for a couple minutes about my background. Um, talk to you a little bit about Armstrong. It is a big uh, company in the, uh, in the region here. What a corporate finance department does, what it looks like. More specifically about a treasury department, where I am, how that fits into corporate finance. Um, you know, and, and talk through with you kind of the pros and cons of, uh, of a corporate life. You know, my background, Dr. Williams covered a lot of it, so I won't, um, you know, I won't harp on some of the, the facts that are up there that he's already uh, pointed out. But, you know, I'm 49 right now, so I've been out of college for 27 years. And, you know, a couple of the things that have happened to me um, and are likely to happen to you if you pursue, you know, kind of a big company uh, career is, you know, you're going to move around. Jobs are going to blow up on you. Companies are going to blow up. Things are going to change. I graduated from college in 86 uh, and went to work for E.F. Hutton, which was at the time uh, a big investment bank on Wall Street. I was living in Manhattan, um, working for E.F. Hutton. It's the end of 1986. 1987, the stock market crashes. You know, most of you probably haven't heard of E.F. Hutton because it doesn't exist anymore. It blew up then. So Shearson Lehman Brothers came in and bought Hutton. American Express bought Shearson Lehman Brothers. Goldman Sachs bought the division of Shearson Lehman that I worked for, all within the span of three years. So, you know, all of that creates a great deal of turmoil. So a year into my career, I'm told that we're eliminating the department and, you know, me and everyone else on Wall Street is out looking for a job. Three months after that, I get an offer from a guy who was in the, in the um, division I worked for, but out in a region, to go work in California for him. So all this stuff's kind of popping up when I'm still just a year into my career and I don't really know what's going on. So I moved to California, um, lived in San Diego for about four and a half years, uh, worked in you know, kind of investment management uh, with, with a team out there, decided I really needed to go back to business school. That I wasn't really sure that this was the uh, career for me. So I went to grad school uh, in Berkeley. I was living in California and it was a state school and it was about all that I could afford at the time. Uh, decided through that process that what I really wanted to do was do something more global and that meant getting into a corporation you know investment management something like that tends to be very regional you want to set up a shop somewhere you want to develop uh, relationships with people in the community uh, get your clients see them through a number of years build up your, your book of business I was more interested in something that was more global so I went to work for American Airlines um, you know the airline industry you know, what's Warren Buffett's joke, you know, the, the, if there had been a capitalist at Kitty Hawk, he would have shot Orville and Wilbur. It's a terrible place to make money. Um, but it's a great place to learn how to be a financial professional because everything is really competitive and dynamic. You've got a lot of competitors. You've got several unions who can all shut you down at the drop of a hat. It's very price sensitive. You know, the flight from Dallas to Miami is the same on pretty much any airline. So how do you compete? How do you move things around? How do you deploy your capital? So I spent a couple of years with that. And one of the things I found working at a company like American Airlines, now here you've got 100,000 employees. Uh, you've got about $25 billion of revenue. This is an enormous company. Um, so they're hiring a lot of people with MBAs and a lot of people right out of school. And you're working on really small slivers of the pie. So I was in the cargo division and I was working on Latin American cargo pricing. So within the greater picture of American Airlines, it's a really tiny piece, but it is hundreds of millions of dollars. And I moved into the Treasury Department there and I really like Treasury because that's a much more global view of the world and I'll talk to you more about Treasury in a minute. But 
Um, from there, you know, for a variety of reasons, reached a point in my life where I was looking to go to a company that was smaller, where I could see the bigger picture, but big enough still that it was a global and meaningful company. And I came to Armstrong in 1998. The company was um, expanding at the time. Uh, we were making several acquisitions, getting more global. My skill set fit, fit in well with the uh, new group that they were bringing in in 98, so I came here. So two years later, in 2000, I'm the director of investor relations, and Armstrong goes bankrupt. We had an asbestos problem. And uh, asbestos in the United States and the lawsuits and the bankruptcies that came out of it is something I could spend hours talking to you about, but I won't. But the point is sort of, you know, I came to this company in 98, it was investment grade rated, asbestos was a comment in the footnotes of the financial statements, and don't worry about it, it's covered by insurance. Two years later, the company goes into bankruptcy, there's a certain amount of, you know, oh crap, what's going on, what's going to happen to my career? You know, as it happens, bankruptcy protects some of the oh crap things uh, that can happen. Um, I had the opportunity then to move to Europe. Uh, so my family and I moved to uh, just outside of uh, London. I worked in our ceilings business. We make 55% of these types of ceilings in the world. So very sexy stuff, uh, but very profitable stuff. <laughs> so I ran, that, uh, ran the finance group uh, outside of London for the entire European region for about three and a half years. Um, and again, you know, you're picking your family up, you're going somewhere. There's a great experience in that. But it's also, you know, there's a lot of challenges, and I can, I can talk to you about that uh, a little more if you have questions about that. So I went there for a couple of years, you know, came back. Uh, it, you know, the company came out of bankruptcy, a private equity firm invested, uh, you know, more uncertainty. So th the point is just that there's a lot of moving around, a lot of uncertainty. You've got to stay fresh with your skills throughout your career. You've got to... You've got to embrace some of the chaos that can happen if you expose yourself to this kind of stuff. So uh, that's the point there. So, you know, who, who is Armstrong? You, you know, we're just down the road here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're about a $2.7 billion firm this year. We make these types of suspended ceiling tiles. We make these types of floors and other flooring products, wood flooring. Um, it's really basic building materials stuff. But it is 2.7-ish billion dollars worth of sales around the world. 30% uh, of our revenue comes from outside of North America. So we do a lot of business in Europe. We do a lot of business in, uh, in Asia. We're looking to grow in those markets because you know, since 2006, 2007, with the housing crisis in the US, you know, the demand for our products in the US is significantly suppressed. A couple of years ago, we were a $3.5 billion company. Uh, and most of that shrinkage is just the demand shrinking. So we're building plants in China, we're building plants in Russia. All of this is for local consumption there. I think there's a misconception that uh, as we build plants in China, we're taking American jobs and moving them overseas. No, we're building plants in China to employ Chinese people to make product to sell in China. Uh, we employ about 8,800 people right now. At the peak, we employed about 10,500 people. So a lot of people have left the company. That's another thing that's going to happen to you here in a, in a, in a corporate environment or in a financial environment. Um, you know, companies are, companies are set up to serve their shareholders and to drive profitability, and they're going to respond to what's happening in the markets in order to do that. So when housing starts goes from $2 million a year to 600000 a year, people get laid off, and that's really unpleasant. We closed nine plants. You know, we took 1,700 people out of the company. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the people that were laid off were working in those plants, but, you know, in the headquarters building in Lancaster, you know, we have a, we have a free building now. We went around the campus and, and eliminated jobs, and as a, you know, manager of people at that time, having to eliminate jobs, I can tell you, is one of the roughest, roughest things that you have to do to take a job away from someone, especially in that environment where you're taking a job away from someone who's not doing a bad job. I've fired people who are doing a bad job, and I can tell you that that's really tough. When you have to walk into someone and tell them, look, we just can't afford you anymore, that's very difficult. So, probably went down too negative of a path there. But anyway, big company around the world, lots of different products. Armstrong's a 150-year-old company. Um, so I'm not going to do the history of the company back 150 years. Some of this touches on things we've done. 
But I want to walk you, you know, a little bit from 2006 to 2013. I talked about, you know, being a three plus billion dollar company to being a 2.6, 2.7 billion dollar company in the last couple of years. You know, profitability wise with everything we did, we went from making 396 million dollars at EBITDA to 400 million dollars at EBITDA. So driving the profitability that the shareholders require is something that we've been able to do despite this environment and because of all the tough things that we did. We also did a lot of big, you know, financial things and management things. We had a new CEO, new uh, head management team come in. You know, in my group, in the corporate finance group, we did a number of things to restructure the balance sheet of the company. I circled a couple of things there. Um, you know, the first one on the left, a leveraged recapitalization. So I'm probably talking to just the two finance people right now, so bear with me for a second. So we look at Armstrong, and I'll show you our balance sheet and our position right now, and every company looks at themselves like this and says, what's my earnings? What's my level of debt? And this is a little bit like things you do as, a, as an individual. You know, how big a house can I afford? I have this much of an income. How big of a mortgage can I have? I have this much of an income, so I can afford this much debt. I put that debt on the balance sheet. Now I can either do something with it. I could buy a company. I could build a plant. Or I could pay a dividend to my shareholders. And that's what we did in 2010. In 2012, because our profitability, look at the EBITDA line, had improved from where it was, we're able to pay out yet another special dividend. And in 2012, we bought back shares as part of a, you know, a, a reconfiguration of our ownership. And in 2013, or that was in 2013. So a lot of things happening in the company in a couple of years, a lot of big corporate finance things that are happening in a couple of years. So we've been active and we've been working on a lot of different things. And you know, the guys who are in my department who work for me, you know, some of them are just a couple of years out of school, they're very much involved in these types of things. And it's, it's a lot of work. You know, when we did that first financing, I was probably working 90, 100 hours a week. I was taking business calls in the middle of my anniversary dinner. I uh, spent weekends in the office. Uh, there was a tremendous, tremendous amount of work for a couple of months there. And the guys who were working for me with me were in the office too. And that's going to happen to you if you work in a corporation. And there's an element of that that that's really hard and that sounds really unfun. But there's also an element of, you know, that's a great achievement. You know, we look back on what we did and the recognition that we got for doing things like that and the camaraderie you build up. It's a little like finals. That goes on for a month or two. But, you know, the intensity of the work that you put into that and the reward that you feel from it after you pass your final, hopefully, uh, is a little like that. So that type of effort, uh, that type of feeling that you get in school continues throughout your career with things like this. Again, to the two people who are finance majors, I, since I'm a finance guy, I'm going to talk to you about how we talk about the company on a financial basis. So we're about a $3 billion company. Companies usually talk about themselves in terms of size, either on their market capitalization or on their sales and revenue. Uh, with Armstrong, that number revolves around $3 billion either way. If you're a high-tech company like Facebook, you definitely talk about yourself in terms of market capitalization because that's enormous. Uh, if you're something like General Motors, who isn't very profitable, you talk about yourself in terms of sales. Um, whatever you can do to make yourself look bigger. So we're a big company, but not an enormous company. We're probably a Fortune 700 company. We trade on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay, our, we're, our credit is rated by Standard and & Poor's and Moody's. I was actually in New York yesterday and met with them for breakfast. Or, well, one for breakfast and one after breakfast. They don't talk to each other. Um, we're banked by all the big global banks of the world. Uh, so, you know, while I was in New York, I met with Bank of America and Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Chase Manhattan. Um, J.P. Morgan is Chase Manhattan. Uh, Deutsche Bank, all the big banks of the world deal with Armstrong. They lend us tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, so they're very interested in us. And, you know, as we think about ourselves, the capital structure, again, for the two finance guys, as a treasurer, I think about my liquidity, where's my cash, where's my backstop if I need cash, if I run out of it. So I have this green bar there, the revolver, is a committed lending facility from those banks. So they promise to lend me money any time in the next five years if I need it. So that allows me to hold actually very little cash uh, around the world right now. And then I've got about a billion dollars of debt, 
We've got about a $3.2 billion market cap. So we're a $4.2 billion enterprise value business. So for a lot of you, these terms don't mean anything. But for some of you, they do. And I just wanted to give you a little feel of sort of how we talk about the company internally. And this is the type of stuff that I talk to the Armstrong Board of Directors about. Is this the right structure for us to look at, to be financially? So, you know, as Armstrong looks to grow and get bigger and more profitable around the world, you know, we're a little constrained in North America. New housing starts used to be two million a year. This year they'll be probably about a million. Long-term steady states about a million five. That hurts our opportunity to grow here. Uh, Europe is very depressed. So we're looking at a number of things that we can do to grow in the face of that environment. One of them is kind of the continual innovation of new products. This is a pretty mid-range ceiling you guys have here. We'd love to come in and sell you something new and something better and something more expensive and something more profitable. Same thing for the floor. So how can we develop new products that people want? Now this is a commercial application, so it's hard sometimes for people to think about this, but you know, th think about you know, your apartment or your parents' homes and the things that they want to do in there. You know, I've got some beautiful wood flooring that we could sell you when you get a little bit of consumer confidence coming back. Uh, you know, when people feel better about the value of their homes, we want to have the right products that we can sell there. So we're focused on the, um, the developed markets, as it were, uh, to try to drive sales uh, and, and profitability there as well. But we're also very focused internationally where there is growth happening, and that's places like China, Russia, the Middle East. And so we're building plants there, we're investing and hiring people there, uh, and we're trying to drive growth there. We're creating businesses within business. So this is a very unsexy ceiling. But within our ceilings business, we've created something called architectural specialties. And if you can imagine walking into uh, a really high-end hotel or a concert hall or something like that where they've got you know, big curved sweeping metal or wood ceilings, that's the type of stuff that we're trying to get into. So we sell this for 90 cents a square foot. We can sell a ceiling like that for $40 a square foot. And the way we sell is we call on architects uh, who are designing new buildings. And one of the stories that we can pitch them is, you know, look, you're doing this giant office building in Hong Kong, and you want to put this really technical uh, fiber composite aluminum ceiling in the lobby, and that's going to be really hard to do and out of your skill set. We can help you with that. We can design all of that and help get it installed, and we'll manufacture it, and we'll work with your contractors around the world. And we want to sell you this ceiling and the other 100 stories of the building as well. So it's a great business on its own within our existing business, and it helps drive the existing business as well. Um, the emerging markets, I sort of talked to you about that. So trying to stay on schedule here. So that's Armstrong. That's how we're looking to grow right now. You know, at some point, the North American markets come back. We make a lot more money here. That's good for everyone. We can hire more people. Our shareholders make more money. Everyone wins. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about you know, what it means to work in a finance organization uh, within a corporation and, and what it's structured like. So this is, this is the actual Armstrong uh, finance organization here. And if you went to any other you know, public company about our size, you'd see something very similar to this, almost certainly. So you've got on the left side what I call the business unit finance. So this is, you know, if you picture the company sort of the way the finance department is, we have a CEO, he's paired up with a CFO. We've got a president of the ceilings business, he's got a finance guy who sits right next to him in sort of a junior CFO role. He's helping him make every decision, where to spend my money, where to build plants, what to do about price, what to do about new product introductions, and that cascades down. So underneath the flooring guy, he's got a, a person in Europe, a person in Asia, a person in North America. In North America, there's a commercial leader and a residential leader. Below them, there's you know, different product line managers. And all of them are typically paired up with a finance partner to help make sure that hey, look, you've got this great product idea. You know, you want to source this from this guy, and it's going to have these characteristics, and we're going to sell it to Home Depot, and we're going to sell it to Lowe's, and uh, we're going to sell it to builders at this price, and we're going to make this much money. Does that really make sense? Is that the best way to do it? Should we make this rather than buy it from someone else, or vice versa? So 
There's probably 500 people or so in the overall Armstrong Finance Department. It's probably 150 each in those business unit roles. And that whole corporate sector, and I went from right to left from for the more general, my role, to more specific, like the tax role. Um, th there's some really interesting things with international corporate tax, but it is a arcane, dark arts world within finance. So I if that appeals to any of you, you can make you know, a really profitable uh, career for yourself by specializing in international corporate taxation, but uh, it it's, it's a, a fascinatingly complex little area. Um, so the corporate finance roles exist because you, you know, one, because you need them for legal reasons. You know, we're governed by the SEC. Uh, we have to do a lot of filings for them. Uh, you know, we're on the New York Stock Exchange. That introduces certain requirements. So we need specialized capabilities within Treasury, controllers, tax. So those organizations tend to not have many people in it. I have about 12 people working for me right now. When I was in Europe in the, in the uh, business role, I had about 60 people working for me. So as I've gone up in my career, I've had less people work for me. Things like the chief in, uh, information officer works within finance. One of the key roles in finance is to make sure the books are correct and accurate, and that's very much partnered up with IT. So it's not uncommon to see you know, the IT person work within the finance organization. He also covers what we call GBS, which is Global Business Services. And this is sort of the overall outsourced nature of the business. As you read about um, you know, back office processes, payables and receivables, uh, and things being outsourced to India for, for low wages, we've done that and grouped that all within what we call Global Business Services. So that's what the finance organization looks like. And while it looks like a very you know, structured command and control type uh, operation, it really isn't because the overall organization is a matrix type structure and most corporations are. The only way I can get work done, having 10, 12 people report directly to me, is to be able to influence the other 500 people who are here and people who are in other functions around the world. You know, what part of my role is investor relations, so that's telling the Armstrong investment story uh, to Wall Street investors. So I have to know what customers want in China and why that difference differs from America. And you know, what a homeowner in Atlanta wants in their house and how that's a product that we specifically can provide better than others. So I've got to talk to the marketing people and I've got to talk to the sales people and I've got to visit these locations. So, you have to be able to operate across these functions. So I would encourage you, if you go into a big environment, don't just worry about what's right on your desk. Try to understand the whole company. Try to understand how it competes, who your competitors are, who your customers are, what they want, what they're doing, uh, where they're better than you, where you're better than them. You know, Treasury specifically. So I touched on a couple of things. So you know, my most important role is to be the steward of Armstrong's cash. The cash that we have, we should never lose. If we need cash for our businesses, I need to be able to get it at the most cost effective, most tax effective way. As we need cash around the globe, I need to get it there with several things in mind. One, I need to get the cash there and I need it to be safe where it ends up and where it's invested. I need to get it there in a way that I'm not paying tax on the way in and hopefully I'm not paying tax on the way out. So this gets to a lot of complex structures. This gets to a lot of, again, different relationships with the Goldman Sachs's of the world and the Citibanks of the world. And you know, can I pledge an asset in this part of the world to get cash in another part of the world? And what are the tax implications of that? And how do I get that cash back here? And what happens if this currency devalues or appreciates while I have this currency here? So I think about all of those things pretty regularly. Um, the capital structure I touched on when we talked about the amount of debt that a company can have. You know, that one of the ways that you can make money for shareholders is to not take too much of their money. So if I'm starting a business and I can get a million dollars from my shareholders and I can borrow $10 million and take this $11 million and turn it into 15, then I repay my $11 million loan my equity investor, my shareholder's $1 million investment is now, it's my math, five, right? If I don't have that much debt on there, they don't get as big a return. So 
debt and leverage, just like with buying your house, you want a really fancy house, but you've got to be able to pay it off. So you've got to walk this line between how much debt helps me get the improved shareholder return while avoiding, hey, too much debt is at some point or other going to bankrupt me and wipe my shareholder out. So walking that line is important and that, you know, that capital structuring is something that you know, I spend a lot of time talking to the Armstrong Board of Directors about and it's not just debt versus equity, it's what do our earnings and cash flow look like, what would we do with this debt or should we return it to people, um, what do the capital markets look like. You know, right now interest rates are really low. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, while I was in, in New York, literally just this week, everyone's wanting me to, you know, issue a bond and, uh, you know, borrow three, five hundred million dollars. You know, my question is, well, what do I do with that three or five hundred million dollars? So if I don't have a use for it, I don't want to borrow it, but it's there and I could borrow it at about five percent. Um, so these banks, you got to talk to them, you got to talk to all your different lenders. Uh, you know, we, we talk to bond investors, we talk to uh, loan investors, so these are insurance companies uh, who have big piles of cash to put to work and they put it into these uh, uh, pools that lend money to us. Um, the rating agencies, you know, we need them to have a credit opinion on Armstrong that helps us go out and borrow whenever uh, they want to, so I talk to these guys pretty regularly. You know, financial risk, I, I mentioned currencies briefly and, you know, again, for you guys doing finance, this is critical. You know, for other folks, even if you're, you know, if you're in marketing or sales, as you think about your strategy, I can get something that's made in China or something that's made in Mexico and I can sell it in the U.S. What happens to that currency after you launch your business and become reliant on a Mexican supplier is really important. If the peso increases in value, your costs go up. If you're competing against someone who's sourcing their product in the U.S., their costs haven't changed, so you're now at a competitive disadvantage. There are things that you can do with financial derivatives to protect yourself or buy yourself time. And this is true you know, on a small scale basis that I just described there, and it's certainly true for Armstrong. Uh, the, our biggest foreign currency exposure is to Canada. We have no manufacturing in Canada, so everything that we sell in Canada is made in the U.S. The Canadian dollar has just gotten 10% weaker in the last six months, so I'm sure you're all aware. And it, it, that has significant implications for Armstrong, but we don't have to panic just yet because I've sold several hundred million Canadian dollars forward over the next few years. And I can explain that to you in more detail later, but I just want to give you a flavor for we're doing these derivative transactions, forwards and swaps and options with you know, with the banks that I talked about to try to protect ourselves from, uh, from currency moves. You know, another element of, of risk is interest rate moves. So we've borrowed, most of our borrowing from the banks and the loan pools is at a variable rate. So we pay interest at LIBOR plus a spread on that. If LIBOR increases, if the Fed raises rates, my borrowing costs are going to get higher. So when we entered into that debt, we did big interest rate swaps. So I've got about $700 million of fixed floating interest rate swaps on the books. So financial risk is managed through derivatives and then operating risk is typically managed through insurance and that happens in my organization as well. So that's property insurance and casualty insurance. Uh, if the plant blows up or burns down, um, how do we get compensated? And you know, and insurance is, I'm not gonna convince you it's interesting, but it's got interesting elements of it. The biggest one is sort of how much risk are you willing to take? And you know, you guys can think about this in your personal life. You know, how much car insurance do you want? How big a premium do you want to pay versus your deductible? You know, can you afford a $500 hit? Can you afford a $1,000 hit in your own personal life? And you want to size that then to the, uh, to the premium you pay. Same kind of concept. Um, what else do I do? The pension plan. So I manage the investment oversight. This is a really big plan. It's $2 billion. We're a $3 billion company with a $2 billion plan. That's really, really big. There are plenty of bigger plans than that, but not at companies our size. So we have to think about, I've got all these retirees and future retirees who are gonna get pension payments, and we've got this $2 billion asset. How do we manage it so that we make sure that they all get paid? How do we manage it so we try not to put any more corporate cash into the plan so that we can preserve that for ourselves? So bond portfolios, uh, stock portfolios, all that kind of stuff, real estate, uh, go in there. Um, 
corporate real estate, I'm responsible for the real estate around the world, um, buying it, selling it, leasing it. Um, lately, as we've shut plants, mostly selling it. And then the last thing is investor relations. So we're a public company. We issue earnings quarterly we, as, as required. You know, we file with the SEC, and then we go out on road shows, and we talk to investors. Uh, we've got 17 Wall Street analysts who cover us, so I'm responsible for the uh, interaction and the communication with them. It's a little bit of a sales and marketing role, but you don't want it to be too much of a sales and marketing role. I try to make it more of an understanding role. Here's who Armstrong is. Here's where we sell around the world. Here's what our products are. And then you as an investor can largely think, do I think Armstrong's going to do better than their peers at making and selling things? And do I think that you know, com the commercial recovery in the U.S. is going to happen faster than other people, and so there's more value in Armstrong stock than is, uh, than is seen in the, uh, in the marketplace. So, you know, pros and cons, and, you know, I I'd welcome questions now or afterwards. Um, and, and I've touched on some of these things here. You know, if you go into a large corporation, plan on moving, plan on being mobile. You know, it, it, especially if you're going to be really anywhere, but especially if you're going to be in a smaller part of the world. You know, if you're in Chicago and you don't want to leave Chicago, you can probably job hop among different companies and stay in Chicago. If you come work for Armstrong and you never want to leave Lancaster, that's going to put a real ceiling on your career. Companies are going to want to move you, are going to need to move you. Things will happen. They will go bankrupt. The stock market will crash. You will lose your job through no fault of your own. Be ready to move. Um, some of that is really a positive. I've lived in a lot of places that I, you know, I've enjoyed living in. Um, I have friends in, in a number of different cities. It, it's great to go back and visit places that I feel comfortable. Uh, you know, I've got a barbecue place in Dallas, I've got a pub in England, I've got uh, a beach bar in San Diego that I really like. So you can accumulate those things, but that has to be something that you want to do. Um, you're going to have peaks and valleys in your work schedule. You will work 100 hours some week. Um, that shouldn't be too typical. Uh, you know, much more, much more regularly, I'm at work at 8 in the morning and I'm out of there at 6. Um, you'll travel. Again, pros and cons with that. I've generally enjoyed that, but if you want to be a salesperson and think that you're never going to leave town, that's just not going to happen. Even as a finance person, you're going to travel. The bigger the company, the bigger the travel. I've been around the world. Um, it's competitive. You know, most companies do this, and if you've read some of these things, you know, employees are rated on a, on a bell curve. Not a pure bell curve, but you know, we get, to get, to, get together every year, and some people in, you know, some of the 500 people in the finance department get rated less effective, and they get smaller raises, and they get their bonus cut. And I'm sure everyone here thinks they're more than fully effective, but the reality is, you, you know, you're going to, it's just like grades. That competition keeps going through. Um, and, and that's going to be just about any big corporate is going to have some type of HR structure that's going to force a forced ranking onto people. And, uh, you know, one, you have to deliver negative messages sometimes, and two, you receive negative messages sometimes. So you have to be able to, you know, be willing to withstand some of those types of things. It can be political and catty and all this other stuff because, you know, as you're trying to move up, you know, it gets more competitive. Um, you know, so those are some of the negatives. But, you know, honestly, I feel that I get great exposure to the economy, to the world, to the business. I have some, you know, great colleagues uh, around the world who I like working for. If I've got, you know, a marketing question or a, a personnel question or a, uh, you know, a, a chemistry question. You know, I go talk to the guys in our labs to try to th think about what they're doing. You can have a lot of really broad-based interesting questions because we are a global company. We sell to Home Depot and Lowe's and we sell to, you know, tiny shops in China and what are they looking for? So it, it gets you a very global perspective and if that interests you, you can really get that out of a big uh, multinational company. So. Any questions or comments on this, concerns you'd have if you wanted to go into a company? I'm willing to be as honest as you want. Yes? So, 
you know, it's really random and it's going to differ for everyone. Um, if I look at my career, you know, I was in New York, I was in San Diego for four years, I went to Berkeley for two, I was in Dallas for four, I went to England for three. Within finance, that's probably a little bit more mobile than, than most, but it's not that out of the ordinary. Yeah? Um, the sale of the cabinets division has probably been pretty good for the company because that was never a core division for us. We kept it way too long. So we bought it back in 1998. It came along with the wood flooring business. We're a flooring company. We're not a cabinets company. We're a global company. We're a branded company. You know, the Armstrong brand, um, you know, the architects who specify ceilings, the Armstrong brand is really meaningful that, for them. You're buying a cabinet for your home. You don't associate Armstrong with the cabinets. It doesn't apply. So the business was a bit of a distraction. So selling it has removed the distraction. We, we didn't do a good job, and I, I actually think a lot of companies struggle with this in terms of, I've got my different divisions, and they've each got a president, and so we've got to have operational reviews. We would have operational reviews in the cabinets business that had $200 million in sales and no profit that lasted as long as the billion dollar ceilings division that made $300 million. And so it truly is a, a management distraction. So it's been good to get rid of it. Yes? How much of the company is like a proxy, you say, profitable if you produce your exporters to other countries? Yeah, we get, you know, if you throw Canada into the mix, we probably have about 35% of our sales outside the U.S. Um, the two problems we would have with trying to just be an American company and exporting, well, there are a couple problems, but you know, one, picture this ceiling tile at, you know, 85 cents a square foot of a sale price. This is going to fill up a container without a whole lot of value in it. So you're putting a lot of freight cost onto, you know, sending it somewhere in the world. You know, and this ceiling uh, and this flooring tile, if you can picture it, it's actually pretty heavy. There's a lot of limestone in this. So it's going to weigh out a container pretty quickly. Our products don't ship very well around the world. And then we do a certain amount of exporting and more importing. It's hard because, you know, that products, believe it or not, this is a fashion item. Not so much this, but something more residential. Styles will change. You've got a lot of product floating across on a, on a boat styles change by the time it gets here they no longer want it now you're discounting it you want to be close to your customers to be able to react to them pretty quickly yes um really you have to speak english to work for us at any significant level um we are not as, you know, we are Armstrong World Industries. We're trying to get to be global. If we're really honest with ourselves, we're more regional. So if you go to the Armstrong office in China, all the managers there will speak English. Most of them will be Chinese, uh, but, they will, but they will speak English. If you're in our French office, th the managers all speak English. Um, it, it, it's not truly a, a global local company. Yes? Do you personally know any uh, additional I know a little bit of Spanish, but it's pretty embarrassingly bad. Um, the, the language one is interesting, because I, I, I think it is a real nice tool to have in, in your, uh, your skill set. Um, it, it also probably depends on the particular language. What I've found is, you know, when, I, when I was in the UK, I covered all of Europe, so I would, I, would, I would be traveling pretty regularly. All the Germans speak English, all the French speak English, although they pretend they don't. In Spain and Italy, it gets a little squirrelier. It, 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 it would be helpful, but the languages that I think could help you are sort of niche. You know, like Russian would be a good language to know. Chinese, I don't think would be because at any meaningful level over there, you're going to find English speakers, and you can really cheat. You, you can get away with an awful lot being an English speaker only. Um, 
my opinion. I think it is a nice skill to have. It's, a, it's also a nice, it's a great skill to have. Um, I think Spanish and a company that works heavily in Latin America, that would be, that would be really a requirement um, if you wanted to, to be successful, my opinion. One other thing on you know pros and cons of of corporate life, um, we'll discuss this later too if you want. It's compensation, right? The higher you go, the more variable and performance based your compensation becomes, and the more longer term it becomes. So you can you can make a nice uh, career and be handsomely rewarded in corporations. The further along you get, the more they lock you in, the more your compensation becomes stock that you're really going to get in five years. And you don't know what that stock's going to do in five years' time, and hopefully it does well. And your bonus is tied to the performance of the company. And as more and more of your compensation gets linked to the company, and if you're in a retirement plan, and now, you know, you guys aren't getting pensions. So just so you know, there'll be no pension in your future. It's all going to be 401ks, and really that's my reality too. You can get yourself really linked to the success of a company, and you want to be really careful about something like that. Um, so just be, aw be aware. Think about it. Get the right opportunities at your age, not necessarily the right check. I took a job for, I think it was like $1,500 more than the other one. And Hutton went bankrupt, and the other bank is Citibank, and they're still around. So uh, you can make mistakes on things like that. So last thing I'll leave you with. Um, so Armstrong uh, Finance Department a couple of years ago instituted something that we call the Financial Professional Development Program. You know, what the companies found is that all too often we're going outside to hire people as opposed to having uh, more junior professionals in the company who are ready to step up and be promoted. So we started going out and uh, recruiting at a couple of target campuses um, and have accepted uh, you know, folks from other universities as well who, who would apply directly with us. You know, the idea is that we want to bring people in right out of college with, you know, this is the finance department, so with finance backgrounds. Our engineering group does this. Uh, our HR group, I think, is looking to do this. You know, we want to bring you in. Um, stick you in a couple of different roles. So you'll, you'll you know, sit in treasury for six, nine months, you'll go to the audit group, you'll go out to a plant, uh, you'll learn how finance works there, you'll go to the businesses and you'll learn what it means to partner with you know, the person who's trying to sell installation uh, materials for our floors and the decision that you know, she's making is she's looking at different suppliers and different branding strategies. So we want to rotate you around, get you exposure to different parts of the company, the idea of, hey, we can eventually then land you in a role in a department uh, for a number of years. You've got broad exposure. You've made a lot of connections. You understand the firm. And as time goes by, you know, we'll promote you. So this program's about four years old right now. Um, it's been three or four people a year. So I, I, I'm not in a position to offer you all jobs. Um, a lot of companies do this. If you are interested in a corporate career, cast a really wide net. Talk to everybody. Get good at interviewing. Um, look around. Find the company that's going to give you the right um, development program. I can tell you that I would not have qualified for this program, so don't be discouraged about that. Um, and we've had some success here. So we've got a couple of Armstrong people here. Carrie Booth works in our tax department, the dark arts part of the uh, company that I mentioned. She's down the hall from me. Um, we work together a lot. Treasury works a lot with tax because we're moving money around the world, and, uh, and she's a grad. Hunter Gross has only been out for a couple of years. Hunter's been a real success at Armstrong. He's had a number of different roles in audit. He's now sort of the go-to analyst, uh, sort of the flex analyst in our ceilings division. Hunter's spending about a third of his time in Russia right now. Uh, we're building a plant over there, and he's the one who's sort of keeping track of all the spending that's going on over there. Uh, and then you know, um, Amanda, who uh, came in in the first class in the Financial Professional Development Program, you know, she reached out to us. We didn't specifically recruit here. She reached out to us. She interviewed really well. She's been through the program. You know, she's now working as an analyst in the, uh, the, the, business, uh, the Global Business Services Center that I talked about and you know, is doing really well and, and is an asset to Armstrong. So, um, you know, the, 
FDPD program is part of the careers site at the company. It will typically be up in August or September. You know, we'd like to talk to, you know, people who are, you know, in, who are seniors at that point and looking to, to start. And we go through a, an interview process and, you know, did be a call and a screen. And if, if, you, if you pass it and if you're interested, we'll, you know, have you over to Lancaster and, and, and talk to you um, on site there. So I'd encourage you if, uh, if you've got an interest in finance to, uh, to come talk to us. So other questions? Yes, sir. How's the employee turnover within the whole company, but more specifically the finance team? Um, turnover is really pretty low. Um, and involuntary turnover, where we really regret the loss, to, it, it, it tends to be very low. You, you know, some of that is, I'll, I'll come back to the whole company. It, it's, it's, some of that is, look, it's a bad economy right now, so people aren't leaving. Some of that is, hey, we're in Lancaster, if you're in corporate finance, You've got to make a bigger move if you want to. Uh, uh, if, if you want to make a move, you know. The, the other is, you know, look. I've worked for the company for 15 years. I, I'm a pretty marketable guy. I could go, especially in a role like treasury. I don't have to know the flooring and ceiling industry to get a job. I could go other places. It's a pretty good place to work. You know, you're you're treated well. It's a pretty collegial environment. Um, you know, especially you know coming from investment banking. You know, there, there's. <laughs> There's not some of the hostility and tension that you get there. Uh, you know, I think people can have pretty satisfying jobs. So we don't have a ton of turnover. Um, you know, as we hire people, you know, as residential, residential markets have started to recover and we're trying to hire people to be, you know, manual laborers in our, you know, wood flooring plants, there's a lot of turnover in pockets like that. Um, if you go to one of our wood flooring plants, you'll be glad you went to college. It's a, it's a rough way to make a living there. What else? I was just in New York. The Super Bowl looks like a non-event there, I can tell you that. They have a little toboggan run in Times Square. It's, it's honestly very silly looking. Yes? Um, what to give back to the community? To give back to the community. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have the Armstrong Foundation. I manage the investments for the uh, Armstrong Foundation. Um, and we make contributions to that periodically. Uh, you know, typically when we have a good year, we'll put a couple million bucks into the foundation and, uh, and then you know, try to make that last. So uh, the foundation gives about a million and a half to two million dollars a year. Uh, it's all North America, there's tax reasons uh, why that is. Uh, what we try to do is a couple of things. You know, we have manufacturing across the U.S., uh, so we will give the you know, the plant in Beverly, West Virginia, based on its size, will tell them, okay, here's some money that you can give away in the community. Get together with some of your, uh, your management team and the workforce and decide what the three or four organizations you want to support in Beverly are. Send us, uh, you know, let us know, and we'll make contributions there. We funnel a lot of our contributions through um, the United Way. Uh, we try to target uh, what we think are the areas that Armstrong could benefit from. So in education, it's you know, science, math, technology. Uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of science in making a ceiling tile. Um, you know, so we try to target those areas. Uh, you know, and honestly, you know, companies do this for, for a variety of good and bad reasons. But uh, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, the best things that, that, that Armstrong does for its community is you know, operate ethically, uh, you know, employ people, give them, you know, quality jobs, give them safe jobs. I, I think one of the best things, and this goes back to shortly after I joined, we got a new CEO as we were going into bankruptcy and he came from General Electric and he looked at our manufacturing and he looked at the safety performance in our plants and he said, look, you guys are below industry average and industry average isn't acceptable. Picture a wood flooring plant. You know, you got, you got guys picking up, you know, boards and throwing them into saws. We have presses. We have forklift. There's a lot of dangerous moving parts. So, we've improved our, you know, safety across the company sixfold. So, that's not giving back to the community as you ask the question. But I think that that is something that the company's taken seriously, spent money on, and it means people are coming back from, um, from dangerous factory jobs safe. And I can tell you the nagging 
that goes on that permeates from that. If I walk down the stairs without holding the handrail or walk in text, it's really annoying. But the, uh, but the safety record of the company is significantly better. And I think that's something that a good company can do to make the communities better. Anything else? Yes? What did you enjoy most about working in Europe? Um, working in Europe. I, I tell you, that was such a, you know, you go through an even keel on a lot of things. There it was a lot of highs and a lot of lows. I, I, I love the travel. Um, it's really easy to travel. As a launching point, being outside of London, you know, going to Zurich for a day, going to Paris for a day, going to Frankfurt for a day, the travel, getting to understand the cities, going back on repetitive basis. Um, particularly to places which would be places where Armstrong had locations. So we had, um, and we had a couple of great ones in Europe. So we had a marketing office outside of Paris. We had a, um, uh, a custom design group in a little town called St. Gallen, Switzerland, which is be really beautiful. And to be back there repetitively and start to feel kind of comfortable and at home there, you know, I had my coffee shop and my restaurant and my bar and my hotel in those areas and, and to kind of get into the groove of it. Um, to be there for multiple years and really, you know, make a make a connection over time, you know, to build up friendships and, uh, you know, plug my kids and my family into school there. That was, uh, you know, that was uh, that was very rewarding. Um, I'm pretty proficient driving on the wrong side of the road now, and can go back and forth with that. Yes. My personal employees, like my staff, <laughs> my staff's definitely happy. Um, yeah, I think people are. I think it's. I think it's honestly a good company to work for. Um, you know, the, the there are a lot of the you know tone at the top type things that do permeate that. It's a very ethical company. Um, when we have things come up that are kind of on the edge of you know, hey, how should we really account for this? How should we really you know, can we really do business with this guy to get this product into this country in the Middle East that may end up in Sudan or something? The, the company walks way over here to do the right thing. And, you know, I think that sets the tone well. Um, I, I think people generally feel pretty good there. Yes? Yeah, uh, so Lancaster is, um, is the headquarters. We've got a corporate campus there. This, uh, that's actually the side shot of our uh, main headquarters building. So we've got a corporate campus in Lancaster that has about, I think it's like 1,100 employees on it. Um, and, and it is a campus. It's got, that's the headquarters building. Then there are a couple other buildings where the, uh, the, the flooring and the ceilings business are. Uh, we've got a design center, a product showcase to bring customers in cafeteria, gym, uh, labs, some other, you know, we've got an acoustics chamber that you walk into and they shut the door and it gets absolutely perfectly quiet because acoustics play a role in the ceilings business. And if you sit in that chamber, after about 30 seconds, you start to hear your, the blood flowing through your body and after about a minute and a half, you're pretty freaked out. So we do a lot of the proprietary uh, research on campus there. You know, the, the company was founded by Thomas Armstrong 150 years ago outside of Pittsburgh and moved to Lancaster, I think, in the early 1900s, and we've been there ever since. All right. Well, look, I really appreciated talking to you guys. I hope I didn't bore you too much, and I hope that, you know, there was one or two things that you got out of this as you think about your careers that, uh, that is useful to you. So thank you very much. Tradition that uh